A man comes into the hotel one day and asks, Do I know The floor is a pristine white marble, ivory, iridescent. No carpets, no rugs. He walked in with his typewriter towards the reception. The desk carved of stone, a back wall, and a slab. A black enamel swirled in by interspersed dollops of tungsten. The jazz dilly dally along a type on a speaker, aesthetically hidden. A piano that lacquered red was placed in the middle of the atrium, cinematically composed. The man in his yellow shirt, linen, white trousers, cotton, brown shoes, leather, bolt, black watch, steel, stainless, are shown up to the room number 57. As he comes down a while later, he leaves the key at the desk. He conveys to the concierge that he remembers too vaguely. He has a terrible memory. He only sees after images. He informs the concierge that every time he enters, he should convey to him he is a mannequin or a weaver. But upon hearing this, the concierge will remind him of his room number. The concierge agreed. Why would he not? It was a beautiful evening. We had the radio on. She just stood there in a pair of black underwear, petite, nimble, and taut. She had a yellow shirt, linen on. It was mine. I sat there watching my shirt, loosely acknowledge and compliment her contours. It was a peculiar pleasure for the both of us. I sat at the breakfast counter. My hair, my neck, and my lascivious tongue followed the riffs of a music, a music that I myself produced. I was making the keys of the typewriter wail, like a drum, like harmonies struck on a piano. With every tap, every bang, I produced flashes of light, flashes that made her see, really see. What is it about her that touches me, I thought to myself. I suppose it is the way she thinks, speaks, in her whole manner, apparently. And this is one of the compliments, the compliments of my own making that moved her the most in her whole life. It is her simplicity. On the dinner table, two pigeons paraded the tiles, the grey rascals. Dear Elizabeth, your pigeons are well behaved, unlike the ones that we have back home in London. They have a waft of entitlement to them, just like the people. I speak of her eyes often. She had once asked me as to what was so special about what was happening in her eyes. I told her that her eyes reflected an obscure distress and at the same time, the glowed of a luminous pride. She had the eyes of an animal peering out of a forest on fire. I decided to step up. I asked her to return my shirt back to me. I returned my keys at the reception. I conveyed to the concierge that I remember too vaguely I have a bad memory, and I see only after images. I told him that every time I enter, I shall convey to him that I am a mannequin with a wiener, and upon hearing this, he is to remind me of my room number. The concierge agreed. Why would he not? I went to the market, and I brought, and I brought some apricots, her favorite. Pumpkins too. But when I asked her why she hadn't taken a bite yet, she told me she disliked apricots a long time ago and thought I should have known. But how was I supposed to know? Excuse me, friend. Friend. Two minutes, please, friend. They stopped me in the middle of the street. Or at least, they tried to. They had a pamphlet in their hands. Maybe even a questionnaire. I suspect. They were looking at me to make a donation. 
I waved them off. Excuse me, sir. Two minutes, please. No. No, 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 no. I do not wish to save the planet. I do not wish to save a tree. I do not wish to save some poor bastard. I do not wish to save the human infant. I do not wish to save the human adult. Nor do I wish to save someone from cancer. Stupidity is the second kindest thing to happen to humankind. Taking a shit, that is the first. Soon afterward, the man returned, and as he passed the desk, he conveyed to the concierge that he is a mannequin with a wiener. The concierge informed him that he has been booked into room number 57. It was a beautiful evening. We had the radio on. She just stood there in a pair of black underwear, petite, nimble, and taut. She had a yellow shirt, linen on. It was mine. I watch my shirt loosely acknowledge and compliment her contours. It was a peculiar pleasure for the both of us. There was a song playing, lyrical jazz. I don't like jazz, by the way. Then why do you keep the jazz channel on all the time? I li like to listen to jazz to convince myself that I'm an intellectual. As a matter of fact, my reasons for listening to jazz are similar to the reasons that all of you esteemed guests have for being here. I like to prove to myself that I am more mature for my age, that I am cultured, sophisticated even. She mimicked the lyric, bent at her knees, twitching. She had her belly button tightly tucked in. The whisk in one hand and a pair of eggs in the other, both of them flailing in a disastrous rhythm. He was whisking egg and I sat there deceiving dates. The rum was reducing the pot along with the sugar. She picked up the bowl and cracked the eggs at its edge, one by one. She was glowing. A gorgeous mess of nostalgia, a knotted up trap of memories, a quicksand of delayed gratification. She dropped in two yolks and whites into the bowl. Whole, clean, but almost. There was a second in time. That second was enough. A second that I never saw coming. A tiny piece of eggshell had fallen in. A hairline prick in the yolks. What followed was a colossal pause. She just stared at the tiny piece of eggshell in absolute silence, gawking at the white enamel rupturing the yolks, scrambling them. I smiled at her with the seed of a date pinched between my teeth. I grinned like an idiot. I was clueless. When I arrived, I became a stranger to her at the moment as she might be to me, as well as a lady I want to behave and look like the lady I imagined for in my poetry. And it is like that sometimes. It is different with her, though. It is tensely cathartic. I'm not a hypocrite, but yes, I do explore irony ironically. I'm like a child with my mania. I pick her up and take her eyes out to see what is there behind her. I am impossibly mischievous and at times not mischievous at all. To be treated by the closest person in your life as a stranger. To become somebody else, somebody she created according to my imagination for me making me what she wished me to be, by being for me that I had imagined. Tasted better than I expected. It was delectable, decadent. It was a beautiful evening. We had the radio on. She just stood there in a pair of black underwear, 
petite, nimble, and taut. She began to shriek, bludgeoning my head to death. The seed of the date shot out from my mouth like a pellet. She whacked my carcass off the stool that it was on. She picked up the deseeded dates and dropped them into the reducing caramelized sugar. I always said I didn't care much for the sugar. The light bulb over the sea. I could hear the rascal breathing down my neck. And I just sat there, brewing in my own depravity. She irked of humanity, blissful the ignorance of the bliss of ignorance. She sloshed some more rum into the pot to reduce and balance the sweetness of the dates. A third of the rum was in the pot, the rest of it unaccounted for. She dragged my carcass to the window and nudged me out. I'm a notorious liar. Every page, every line is a fresh lie. I always thought that in the end, the lie shall bring her more solace. After all, a man who loves is never an honest one. At least, that is what the play suggests. I believe you have read it. The errors of men are easy to mend. Users have to punish them. But when they are honest, it is as if they cast you out of their lives, out of their hearts. Yes, exactly. That is what I read as well. The play was written by a woman. I would have assumed that she would have known more about her own kind. Anyways, I suppose we cannot blame her. My muse never read the play. My tiny bit of insight though, love is like tossing a peanut up in the air and trying to catch it with an open mouth. You miss a few. It is a practice, one that you have to indulge in every day. I felt her way down the window. I had a can of energy drink in my pocket. I took the can out of my pockets and examined it as I fell 57 floors down along the facade the hotel room. I punctured the bottom of the can and seated with my lips and put a tablet atop to allow for the juices to flow at breakneck speed. And soon enough I felt a sharp pain in my back, like thousands of needles trying to escape from between my shoulder blades. Feathers sprouted from my ribcage. Bones morphed and fused together, forming new connections. Never had I felt so free before in my life. The intoxicating pleasure of freedom all but drowned me out the pain. My wings flapped against the wind, lifting me off into the sky and saving me from my fall, taking me to the land of dreams. I fly back, or at least fall back, with style down to the reception. Fifty-seven minutes later, I, extremely upset, my wingspan covered with mud, my shirt absent, my face, almost not a face at all, returned to the reception. I convey to the concierge that I am a mannequin with a wiener. The concierge was besides himself. He told me to try to not pull one over them. I told the concierge that I was thrown out of my window. I need to get back to my room to get my typewriter back. I remind him that I remember too vaguely. I have a bad memory and I see only after images. The concierge looked at me with a smug smile and asked, A woman? I replied with a smirk, No, worse, a muse. She could still hear me breathing. She could smell me. Sweet, musky, woody, oaky, peppermint memories of me. Maybe it is the room. The furniture, or the environment that keeps in memory. Perhaps it was that damn shirt of mine. She was glad she was moving out tomorrow, such and such a time. 
The next time, though, I'm sure he's going to be compelled to slit my throat, slice off my lips, and keep my mind as his spastic trophy. I'm a sleeping giant, a proud arrogant, a horrible glory, lurking, stalking, preying on her soul, condemning her to this paradise. Reconciling the peace, she knew I'll be back. Such is with poets. She ran her hands through her hair, taking in a long, seductive sigh along with my life. She sat there on the couch, snarling. Perhaps even in my absence, I drove her crazy. She rubbed at her nipples and thigh gap through my limb. I suppose she kept the shirt. I can't know for sure. 